There are events in each of our lives that have a profound effect upon us and change us forever. On March 11th, 2011, while my husband and I were serving in the Japan Sendai Mission, we witnessed a mega earthquake, which moved the main island of Honshu eight feet closer to America. It changed the axis of the earth by 10 centimeters. This triggered a giant tsunami, the highest wave measuring 36 meters, which devastated 300 miles of coastline in our mission. This caused the Fukushima power pot nuclear power plant meltdown, which is still an ongoing concern. On March 11, 2011, at 2.46 p.m., we were in the Kordiyama Church building on the second floor in the chapel. Um, they don't have a lot of space, so instead of building out, they build up. And we had had a wonderful morning. Our missionaries in that zone had met. We had 15 missionaries with us. They had met. We had given them training. That afternoon, they were teaching members uh, the lessons. And all of a sudden, we were hit with an incredibly powerful earthquake. We, being in Japan, and we have a brother Irene here who served in Sendai, you are used to earthquakes um, because you're in the Pacific Rim, and until things really fall off your table and things, you really don't notice it. But this was something different. It felt like um, a semi going 100 miles an hour or a locomotive just hit that building. And um, it continued. Reed ran to the door. One of the things that you must do is always get to the door and open your door because as the earthquake shakes the building, it makes the roof kind of cave in so you're stuck inside your, your room or inside your home. He ran to the chapel door and opened it. I ran because the chairs were starting to topple over. I ran to a bar which went across the window and held on to that. It's an interesting thing that happened. Both of us had an incredible clarity of thought. We were not um, anxious. We were. It was as if we were riding a bucking a bucking bronco. I mean, we were just we were just being thrown around. All the tables fell over. Everything was thrown around the room. When the um, earthquake died down enough that we could actually move, the missionaries were told immediately to evacuate the building. Of course, the elders they're out on the street. And the rest of us are still in the building. And I was at the top of the stairs, and Sister Mizumoto in her 70s was right in front of me. And then the earthquake became really intense. I did not know that stairs could actually rock as if you were on a ship. But they were rock rocking almost 90 degrees. And um, I was afraid Sister Mizumoto would go down the stairs. And they were very steep, so I put my arms around her and I held on to the railing. And behind me, I was braced by Reed. And at one point, the building was filling with smoke. And I turned to him and I asked, is the building on fire? And he said, no, the building is just breaking up. And the din of all of the dishes, think of the kitchen, and everything is flying around. The, they don't have forks and knives, little chopsticks flying in the air. Um, but all the platters, everything in your refrigerator, we didn't get back home until Oh, almost a week later, and everything had been thrown out of the refrigerator, so all of the meat had spoiled. Everything opens up. Everything flies, I mean, through the air. And uh, we finally got out on the, on the um, street. It was a small, narrow, one-way street. Now, the, when I say narrow, it, some streets are so narrow in Japan that you bring in your rearview mirrors so you can get down them. This wasn't quite that narrow, but across the street was a Buddhist monastery and the rock wall had caved in, all the haka stones, the big monuments to the dead were thrown around like tinker toys. We were standing there um, talking to our sister missionaries when all of a sudden we couldn't see the building across the street. It looked as if ash had come from someplace and I said, oh my goodness, is something on fire? And the sister missionary said, no, this is snow. And we were hit with a terrible blizzard right out, out of no place. And we had blizzard-like conditions for over a month. Uh, spring didn't come when it was supposed to come. And I remember driving through some of these cities and looking at the mud and the cold and these people trying to dig and find family members and find their belongings. And I remember turning to Reed and saying, how much more can these people endure? And then all of a sudden I thought, you know, this might be a real blessing. 
because if this were warm and there were flies, the stench of death and the mold and the disease would have been horrible. So even the, even the cold became a real blessing. Um, I remembered at, when we were standing in the street that I didn't have my purse. I got to have my purse. So I said, I've got to have my purse, Reed. I mean, so he ran into the building and immediately was followed by all of our elders. I went under the building and retrieved the car and we got the sister missionaries in the car because it was so cold. We drove down two blocks around the debris and to the church parking lot, they have another parking lot down there, and a large fissure ran across the church parking lot and the, and the uh, earth had dropped. Reed was on his cell phone, found that the epicenter was in Ishomaki, which is just a little bit north of, of Sendai, and so we headed out with our assistance. We drove for 10 hours, and finally the bridge had given out and we couldn't go any farther. We drove back to Sendai, our missionaries, oh, I'm sorry, we drove back to Kodayama, and our missionaries had moved into the um, evacuation center, which was the fire station. We went back to our hotel because we had all of our belongings on the 11th floor. We asked if we could go up and retrieve our belongings, and they just looked at us like we were crazy. No one goes up any stairs. And they said, we can give you a blanket, but we don't have any more blankets left, but we do have some bedspreads. And you can stay, this is now an evacuation center, if you can find a place on the floor. We walked into every ballroom. We walked through that entire hotel. There was not one inch of floor space left. It was taken up by all these people. But we did find a very narrow wooden bench by the um, the checkout, kind of check in, you know where you check in. And, um, and I slept really well. Reed didn't have enough room to even put his legs up. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, we were jolted awake by a horrible aftershock. And we heard the debris just falling in the streets. And then we noticed our cell phones had gone. So think about um, nine minutes of being thrown around, and then you have no gas. They heat their homes with uh, kerosene. With kerosene, and they, no gasoline, no roads, no electricity. Um, you lose all your water. And if you don't have a food supply, there's no food. So. Everything shut down. But we did notice that the landline phones were, were working. So Reed was able to call Elder Stevenson, who now is the, in the, who is the presiding bishop of the church, Elder Gary Stevenson, with the whereabouts. Because as we were driving up to Sendai, um, he was calling our missionaries, finding out what was happening, where they were, and how you know, they were getting along before the um, cell phones, because of overload and then two large communication towers had caved in. So uh, I remember sitting there, and they delivered a newspaper. And I asked them if I could have the newspaper. Let's see, Rita, you can hold that up. And I remember sitting on that bench with Reed and looking at this newspaper. And it was so overwhelming, the devastation. And I remember telling Reed and asking Reed, I, I just remember turning to him and saying, oh, Reed, this is far greater than anything we could have ever imagined. We knew at that point that we couldn't do really much unless we had the Lord with us at all times. It became an incredibly spiritual time. A time where we really felt the hand of the Lord and we were guided and we were uh, shown where we should drive and what we should do so that our missionaries would be safe and so that we would be able to uh, accomplish the work that we needed to do. <clears throat> This is the uh, picture right outside of our church in Miyako that there's a 15 foot retaining wall there that was supposed to stop the tsunami but the water just came above it uh, just like it was going over the gutter. Remarkably our church which was a block away sustained no damage. So the Lord protected our church so that we could use that to house volunteers and food and supplies. Sister Tatioka and I used to run along that uh, uh, retaining wall, and we'd see this sign that said tsunami warning. We just laughed and said, you know, tsunami will never come in this far, and it'll never go this high. But obviously we were wrong. You can see the street sign there and, and see uh, uh, how that tsunami was uh, higher than the street sign. The destruction, as uh, Sister Tatioka told you, was a nine magnitude earthquake and, and tsunami. There were 15,000 people that were dead, two Latter-day Saints. 
Uh, 5,000 people remained missing at the time of, of our evacuation. Uh, there were half a million homes in northern Japan destroyed, including 60 members' homes. When we talk about destroyed, we're talking about uh, nothing left. There's, there's no foundation. It's just all blown away and destroyed. 23 of our meeting houses sustained varying degrees of damage. The meeting house where we were in, that Sister Tatio could talk to you about, actually the foyer separated from the chapel. You could actually see light through the building and see where the foyer and the chapel separated. Um, the earthquake also destroyed the cooling functions of the nuclear power plant and uh, caused destruction for 300 miles. Just took out the center of our mission. This is what it looked like when we said people uh, lost their homes. Uh, there was nothing left. Uh, you'd, you'd walk down the streets and it's just debris. Uh, some of the c cement buildings withstood, but all of the frame buildings were just, uh, they were broken off their foundations by the earthquake and then the tsunami just came and washed them away. This is a picture or a map of our mission. Our mission uh, is the northern part of this main island, all, everything above Tokyo. And you can see this is where the epicenter of the earthquake was, and you can see the devastation came right through the center of our, our mission. After we uh, evacuated the elders and we came back, uh, we had study session with our elders, and, and uh, Elder Kurita, who was over in Miyako, shared this scripture with us, which we think best describes our situation and the situation with our elders and sisters. Yea, it came to pass that the Lord our God did visit us with assurances that he would deliver us. Yea, insomuch that he did speak peace to our souls. There is no question in our mind, nor in the missionaries, nor in any of the members, that we were only saved because of the grace of our Heavenly Father. We were only saved because the still small voice told us where we needed to be and what we needed to do. And every member will tell you that there was a prompting. They were told where they needed to be. Those who heeded the prompting were saved. Those who did not heed the promptings, those who were too worried about their homes and their cars and everything else, uh, were destroyed. One of the sisters said that she had heard the warning signs, um, the big sirens were going. We heard sirens for about 24 hours. They just never stopped. And she got in her car knowing that she would have to evacuate because the tsunami was coming. And the problem with the cities, they only had these little one, one lane going in and one lane going out. So there were terrible traffic jams. And she was caught in a traffic jam and yet these sirens kept blaring. And so she pulled off the road left her car and started to run towards high ground. And there were all these people sitting in their cars. And she said, I banged on their windows and told them, get out, save yourself, the tsunami's coming. And she says, some of the people had earphones in and they were just listening to the tunes. And other people would roll down their window and they would say, this is a brand new car. I'm not gonna leave my car, it might get hurt. And as she got up to the high ground, she watched the wave just come and, and destroy all those cars. And then she asked, in the, in the church, in, in sacrament meeting, she said, how many of us either blank out and don't want to listen to the warning voice of our prophets, or we're so enamored with our things that we can't just leave them in time of emergency to save ourselves? This is a, a scene similar to what we saw as we drove down the road. This is Sister Tatio we took out of, the, out of the window of the car. And uh, it just shows the devastation that was there. there. There's nothing to rebuild. They have to just start from scratch again. And wherever you went, there were cars piled up along the roads. Everything was just uh, incredible destruction. There was an incredible force that uh, just threw everything around and broke everything up. And uh, so these are, you know, a month later, we're still, people are still digging out. The reason that the problems was because transportation was cut. Communication and transportation are the two keys that uh, uh, people need to be concerned about in terms of emergency preparedness. If you can't communicate and you can't have transportation, then you're in, in rough shape. Uh, we were fortunate in that there were enough roads that were open that we could get supplies in. The first truck uh, arrived the day after the tsunami. Uh, farmers down in southern Japan, recognizing that we would be in dire straits, 
field trucks with their food from their warehouse and uh, drove all night to get them up to us. And so we had uh, food the next day from members of the church who were faithful and uh, didn't wait for a call from their bishop, but just did what they thought was necessary as the spirit prompted them to, to, to uh, come and help, help us up there. This is the airport. This airport is 12 miles inland. And uh, you can see the, the height of the water. This canopy is 15 feet above the ground. This is where you drive under, you know, to unload your passengers and it protects you from the rain and the sun. Uh, you can see how high the water was, and this is 12 miles inland. Elder Carthew said, when the first big earthquake hit, I thought I was going to die. But I saw other people praying, so I dropped to my knees and started to pray for the other missionaries. As important as the physical preparation is, the spiritual preparation is much more important. Uh, you can do anything as long as you have faith and hope. And uh, we found that the more uh, stronger than the tsunami, stronger than anything there, was the message that uh, was brought by the Spirit that we would be okay and things would be taken care of. This is a map that was later sent to me uh, by the uh, brethren. The uh, Fukushima power plant is right here. This is our our, ward, our closest ward house, as you can see, is just right next to it, um, our branch. The red areas are the areas that had no food and water and gas and transportation. The green areas are the parts of our mission that were basically unaffected, that were still safe, uh, where you could buy gasoline, where you could still get food. This is Elder Andrus. I want everyone to feel the peace and assurance that my father has given me and I will seek his guidance as I try to share it. Uh, these missionaries were focused. They understood more than ever before that their every second of survival was dependent upon our Heavenly Father. And they were going to go out and show our Heavenly Father how much they loved him by spreading his word and helping the people. We were fortunate that we were down in a south far enough that we could go down a little bit further and set up a command area to assess damages and start getting supplies. Uh, these maps, or, or these charts, these maps are our, our, our uh, uh, branches. Our branches became areas of refuge. So people without homes would come and stay in the, the chapels and, and live there. And our missionaries would live there uh, where they could have comfort and peace and, and be protected. Um, the uh, chart over here with all the X's <laughs> show the areas that don't have food and water and gas and, and uh, what, what was needed. Um, the church was remarkable in the supplies that it provided and in the fast offering assistance that was given to members. This is Bishop Otomo. Bishop Otomo had the difficult job of finding his ward members when the homes were no longer where the streets were. And uh, he had no communication. So what he did is he set up a bulletin board on the outside of the church and he asked the members to find the other members. This is a list of those people that had not been found at the first, uh, after the first day or so. And so people would come to the church, check off the people, let them know that they were still alive, let them know that, you know, what they needed, if they needed food or if they needed water. Um, and uh, that's how we had to do it because there was no communication. And remarkably, the people knew, instinctively they knew to come to the church where they would be safe and where they could go and help others. And so they'd all come in, get instructions, they'd go out and find people or go out and take food and go out and do what they needed to do. This is uh, Sister Furukawa. During my first Zone conference after two weeks in the mission field, a strong earthquake occurred and I thought I might die. However, because I was in a church, I was kept from harm by God. The churches became our sanctuary. They were a place of refuge. They were a place where we knew we would be protected and safe and could have a roof over our heads. This is, uh, as soon as the tsunami hit, as soon as the earthquake hit, there was a run on the stores. And uh, 
So this is what the, the stores look like. They're just empty shelves. Within an hour, there was nothing left on the shelves. And the first things that went were um, toilet paper and uh, food that you didn't need to cook. You know, anything that you could eat uh, without cooking, were, they were gone within seconds. And uh, then, of course, everything else was gone. The other problem was getting fuel, gasoline, whoops, gasoline and uh, heating fuel. There they heat by kerosene, and so people would go to get to kerosene. Gasoline, within a few hours, the gasoline supply was all gone. And because trucks can get in to replenish it, uh, most people were stuck without means of transportation. Gasoline was, was more valuable than gold because if you wanted to get to your family and you wanted to get find out if your children were alive and go to the schools, you needed gasoline. People would park their cars at night in line in the gas station and come back the next day and wait for hours to get five gallons of gasoline, five liters of gasoline, two, two and a half gallons. And uh, you'd wait there every morning and get your gasoline. This is, an excerpt. this is an excerpt of a letter that I wrote home to our children on March 21st, so 10 days after. We are back in Sendai, no water or gas. Everything is quiet, few cars, and nothing is open. Food and water are hard to get. We had an, the area presidency to our home two days ago, and they really had to rough it. Elder Higashi, the Higashi serve as one of our senior couples, went to a river and got some water for our toilets. I, don't have, I didn't have any idea how much water we use and how we take it for granted. March 22nd, we learned that the stores would finally be open today. We got Elder and Sister Thomas, another senior couple, and got in line about 8.15. We were about 100th in line. By the time the grocery store opened at 10 a.m., over a thousand people were in line waiting to get food. We were allowed only 10 items of food at any one time. We traveled to Kamisugi, and Kamisugi Ward was filled with the supplies the church sent. They also have many volunteers. We also went to the Izumi elders' apartment. Their apartment was a mess. The glass sliding doors were shattered. The desks had been thrown around the room. The washing machine and dryer had toppled over in the bathroom and knocked the bathroom sink off the wall, causing much water damage. It is difficult to travel, even as an emergency vehicle, because of lack of gasoline. March 24th, the members have nothing. They can't get food, water, gasoline. They don't have heat. Everyone waits in line for hours. March 26th, travel to Miyako. Mud was everywhere. No one spoke. Everything was completely silent. Some people had small buckets of water and were trying to clean the thick mud from their belongings. There was no happiness. No light in anyone's eyes or face. These people had lost all hope. The weather is freezing. They have stacked up their stuff neatly along the streets. Mannequins all together, TVs all together, shelves, washing machines, tables, chairs, piles upon piles of wet tommy mats, etc. One couple who owns an, an art gallery were out washing off their paintings with a small bucket of water. We met with President Takahashi, the branch president of Miyako. He was gracious and said they were all doing well. He showed us a map of where the tsunami hit. Some of the people went back to their homes in the tsunami zone. Within 20 minutes, a 36-foot wave hit Miyako, carrying those who felt safe out to sea. The branch building really should have been washed away, but the wave suddenly turned the other way and destroyed everything a block away. The branch president expressed his gratitude to the Lord. This is a picture of the uh, grocery stores a month after the tsunami. Uh, Sister Tatum told you, you can see that there are now getting a few things and a few people are allowed into the store. Uh, there was, there's no looting, uh, no one uh, trying to break in. Uh, they all sat and wait, they waited their turns, but there wasn't much to, to get. This is the line for water. Uh, the government truck would come every morning and bring water, and people would come with their teapots and their buckets and their pans and uh, get their ration of water for the day. 
Water was a valuable commodity. The elders loved the water lions because they could preach the gospel here all day long. Nobody would get out of line. And they uh, preached uh, from one, one person to the next and just uh, enjoyed, enjoyed the uh, captive audience that they had. This is another cartoon. The miracles have really continued. We have found water that we can drink, and we found food that we could eat. When the tsunami first hit, I gave the instruction to the elders. I said, each day the first item of business is to get water and food for the day. And then after that, you could go out and proselyte. We knew we couldn't get more than enough water for the day. We knew we couldn't get enough, more than enough food. It was much like the Israelites. Uh, the Lord provided the food for that day, and, and none of our people went hungry. Although some of the members gave up their food for the elders and sisters, and I think that was what eventually required the brother to move us out of that area. We were starting to be a burden on the, on the saints. This is Elder uh, Warren. The effects of the earthquake were terrible. Collapsed bridges, roads rendered unusable, buildings falling down, shortages in food, water, and fuel, and limited communication by phone, etc. But amidst the physical and emotional devastation, several of the members in the church in Kordiyama, where I was serving at the time, dropped everything to seek out the missing individuals and to transport supplies to those in need. Some did so on bicycles, riding incredible distances when gasoline was in short supply. Even in such dire circumstances, they lost themselves in their love for their fellow men. Now, some people have asked me before, what happens to the saints who have food storage? Do they give that up? And the answer is, is yes. You can't, you can't go and see your neighbor not having anything to eat or drink and, and not just share. And so uh, those food supplies didn't last very long. Sister Uchiyama serves, or was serving at the time that we left in the State Relief Society presidency. And she said she, she was caught in the tsunami. And she said, I wasn't afraid of the water because my father had been a fisherman. But her car went up on top of the wave. And so she rolled down her window and she waited until um, a pole shot past her and she grabbed hold of the pole and held it out of the water. And she used the pole to measure the depth of the water when, when her car started to slow down. When she could finally touch the ground, she struggled from her window and started walking in this freezing, cold, snowy water. And it was just jet black because it, it was the sludge off the bottom of the sea. And it just really is, it has a horrible stench to it. And she started walking towards high ground when she heard some screaming and it was coming from a car. It was a grandmother with three of her grandchildren. And they couldn't get the car door open nor could they get the window down. And she said, my first reaction was, save yourself. Just get to high ground. And then she thought, no, you are a Christian. You are a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. You cannot leave these people. And at that time, a desk floated by, and she used the desk to break the window, and she was able to get the little children out of the car. And she took the little children up to rescue workers, and the next day, she started her walk home. It was 12 and a half miles, and all the streets were flooded. The only place that she could walk was on top of the railroad tracks. And it was freezing cold. She hadn't eaten, and her, her clothes were still wet. And she said, the thing that kept me going was what Sister Julie Beck had said in conference, in the uh, church-wide sisters' conference, just six months before. And this is what Sister Beck said to the sisters. Our presidency has prayed, fasted, pondered, and counseled with prophets, seers, and revelators to learn what God would have us do to help his daughters be strong in the face of the, of the calamity which should come upon the inhabitants of the earth. An answer has come that the sisters of the church should know and learn from the history of Relief Society. Understanding the history of Relief Society strengthens the foundational identity and worth of faithful women. She said as soon as she heard that, in September, she began to study everything she could about Mary Fielding. So all the way home, as she trudged in the snow, she kept saying to herself, if Mary Fielding could get across the plains, I can get home. If Mary Fielding could get across the plains, I can make it home. When she got home, she was met by her husband, who was not a member of the church, who was not a member of the church, and he informed her that there was a 
a senior citizen center close by. They had had no water and no food. And they had had in Nagamachi their very first uh, preparedness fair in November, just five months before this uh, occurred. And she had stored some water and she had stored some food. And they took over all their food and all their water and gave it and fed those people in the senior citizen center. This is Elder Andrews. I know stronger than before that God lives and that he loves and cares for me and the rest of his children. We called my mission president who was inspired to move me from Milwaukee City just before the earthquake occurred. He has provided us with enough to eat and a place to sleep in comfort, and even what many other missionaries do not have, the presence and support of many of my fellow missionaries. And a place of comfort was there. <laughs> This is Sister Onda. The earthquake showed me that there is a conclusive difference between those who know the gospel and those who don't. We have trust in the Lord. We feel peace, security, and comfort. But people do not know the Lord. They have nothing on which to rely in a terrible time. They feel fear. Here's Elder Taylor. I'm thankful for the calmness that came over not only me, but all of us missionaries that were in the same building. I have truly felt the hand of the Lord throughout this entire thing felt the guidance of the Holy Ghost. Uh, the brethren required our missionaries to be evacuated, and so we left, uh, which was uh, no small uh, feat because we had no public transportation. We had only uh, one or two cars in the mission. Uh, but we were all miraculously safe and, and were able to leave the mission and, and get to uh, the island to the north in, in Sapporo, and that's a picture of all of our missionaries. Not one missionary was lost. The only missionary that was hurt was one missionary who was carrying out a man who he was saving through the rubble and debris, and slipped and fell and cut his knee open. This is Elder Mitsuda. I just felt a calm assurance that all would be well. I didn't have any fear. I wasn't worried for myself my companion, or for any of the missionaries in my zone. In my heart, I felt they would all be fine. This is a target to award. Um, this platform here is about four feet or so above ground level. You can see where the water level went through the building. This is the inside of the building. You can see where the water went right through the building. This is uh, Elder Hildebrandt, who miraculously uh, when the tsunami came, he and his companion went to the church. The church is on two floors, so the chapel's on the, on the second floor. So as they got to the second floor and the tsunami came through, they were safe. Had they been on the street, they would have been washed away. I was in the church for 20 hours watching the fires and feeling the earthquake. I prayed for forgiveness. I prayed for safety. I prayed for my friends. I prayed for all those affected. But I remember one distinct thing while I was in that church in Tagajo, Japan. I learned that even with suffering in the world, God does exist. There's the inside of the chapel. You'll notice there's nothing in the chapel. It was all washed away. We found the refrigerator from the uh, kitchen inside the chapel. At one point, I went to the window and after opening it, looked up at the sky that just an hour before had been filled with clouds and the snow that had fallen earlier that day, and I saw none of it. I saw a clear sky to where I could see the stars so brightly. I did not think that I had seen such a beautiful sight before. As I looked, I felt peace. And there's a picture inside the building, a copy of the Book of Mormon, amongst the mud and debris. Here's Elder Hildebrandt's testimony. I felt and knew that it would be okay, and that the next day I would be out, and the sun would shine brightly. Just as it says in the scriptures, then came a still small voice. I heard it. Now, these elders uh, walked out through the rubble and the debris to the next ward house, which was you know, 10 miles away or so, uh, to safety, where they had a place where they could stay. Uh, after this all occurred, then we had lots of opportunities for service, and, and uh, so we were out helping people dig out and, and uh, get back into their homes and things. And uh, even the mayor of Tagajo uh, recognized us for the service that we performed. 
We weren't allowed to uh, proselyte while we were doing service. And so we got together and sang, uh, I am a child of God. And with tears streaming down his face because he knew what we were saying was true, he thanked us for our service along with uh, many of the other people there. This is Miyako. We started here when we started the slideshow. Um, our missionaries there had a difficult decision. When, they, when the earthquake hit, they were inspired to go to their evacuation center. Uh, Sister Tatioka, the zone conference before, had miraculously informed every elder where their evacuation center was. So every elder and sister knew exactly where to go when the tsunami hit. That too was a, obviously a blessing to our Heavenly Father. The elders went to the school, that was the evacuation center, they were in the gymnasium, and the water started to rise. They went from there to the uh, second floor, and the water kept rising. They went to the third floor, and the governor was about ready to call out the helicopters to come rescue when the water finally subsided. They were there at night with dozens of uh, orphaned children who had lost their uh, parents in the tsunami. And uh, they knew that they had blankets and fatones and food in their apartment. And so they decided that they would walk out of the evacuation center, go back to their apartment and go get some food and see if they couldn't fix some food for these young kids. And when they went out, this is what they saw. And they had two choices to make. One was to walk through the middle of this to get back to their apartment. The other choice was to go on high ground where the church was and walk around it. The Spirit told them to go through the rubble. And they just shook their head and said, that's crazy. But the spirits told them again, go through the rubble. So they shined their flashlight out there and tried to make a path through. And out in the distance, they saw a flashlight shine back. And they knew that there was somebody out there trapped in the rubble and in, in the water. So they ran out there, broke open the door, and rescued two elderly gentlemen from the rubble and saved their lives. Had they not listened to the prompting of the spirit, there would have been two more casualties. The parking lot of their apartment, some three weeks later, looked like this. Uh, just rubble all over. This is what Elder Kurita said. If we, hadn't taken, or if, we, if we had taken the larger road, the two men wouldn't have seen our flashlight and might not have been helped. If we had not followed the promptings, we wouldn't have been able to help them. It was a special prompting. I know. I know that prompting was from the Holy Ghost. This is the road going into Miyako. You can see it's been completely washed away by the, by the tsunami. This is Elder Dick, his companion. Although I may lose my home, my life, my family, my every earthly possession, my Savior is always standing tall with outstretched hands, ready during any time or trial to lift me up again. I love my Savior. He gives me everything I need and more for peace, strength, and happiness. Every detail has played an important role in bringing me not only closer to the people of Japan, but much closer to my Savior. Staying in an elementary school for three days, waiting through the flooded streets of Miyako to help in any way we could. Seeing the tear-stained faces of families that are now homeless and sitting in the middle of broken cities are the things I will never forget. I will never forget the lessons taught and the spirit felt. I have found a deeper love and a stronger spirit. I want in every way to be a, good, a great missionary so that the people here can know that although they may have nothing, the Lord will lift them up and put them higher than they were before if they will simply put their trust in Him. This is the back of their apartment. This is what it looked like. I made a commitment in my own life that when I lose all that I have, when those I love are taken from me, when the world is so heavy it takes me to my knees, that I will have a strong enough relationship with my Lord and Savior to stand up again and to push through the dirty waters to the end, where I can finally see and thank the Savior for all that he has done for me. Downtown looked like this uh, after a few weeks, just uh, a mass of garbage. And wherever you went, uh, this is what it looked like. This is Riku Takuda. Our Relief Society president lived in that city, out in the middle of that city somewhere. Uh, this is uh, three weeks, three months later. And uh, this is uh, six months after. This is where she lived. This is uh, uh, 
Uh, it was an open sports court up in the mountains. Uh, there was no heat, there was no sanitation. Um, they were assigned to a tent that they would live in, a little pup tent. And uh, that's how they lived for months and months and months. Um, um, when we went up to visit um, Ichino Seki, Sister Okada, the Relief Society president, asked if he could, if she could uh, visit with Reed after the meeting. And since we had four districts and one stake, Reed was over the welfare of those three districts. Or four, I'm sorry, four districts. And uh, as they went into the office, she said um, he was thinking in his mind, well, she'll need food and she'll need water, she'll need clothes. All the things that she had lost because she lived in Mikuzantakada. And as he closed the door, she says, I need um, my most precious possession was washed away and I need it restored. I lost my temple recommend. Could you give me back my temple recommend? That's all she asked for. This is President Yamazaki. <laughs> President Yamazaki had the unenviable responsibility to see to the physical well-being of his members. It wouldn't have been so difficult except for nobody was where they used to live because their homes weren't there. Uh, he took a van full of food and clothing and water and gas and went out to find by the Spirit his members. Uh, miraculously they found every member. When, when uh, he ran out of gasoline for his van. The church provided little scooters, which were even better because he could get through the rubble and get through these broken down streets. And he, he uh, took supplies to his, his branch members. Uh, soon the tires wore out and blew out because, of course, you're not driving on nice streets, you're driving over rubble. And then he went on with the rims of his uh, little motor scooter. When he ran out of gasoline, he uh, resorted to hitchhiking with uh, as much food as he could carry so that he could find his members and take them the supplies that they needed. One of the sisters that uh, he needed to find was Sister Yoshiki. Sister Yoshiki was separated from her family and for three days had no food or water. She prayed that uh, President Yamazaki would find her. And uh, of course he did. And when he met her, when he finally found her, she threw her arms around him and said, I knew you'd be here. What a great testimony to us all of the importance of a good uh, church leader and the responsibility they have uh, over their members. As we got out to the families and the homes and we saw the devastation among the people, it became uh, even more severe. We understood even better than before uh, what the devastation was really like. Um, there was just uh, nothing left and the people's lives were just shattered and taken. We found photos of their weddings and their, and their birthday parties. We found uh, uh, wallets. There, there were thousands of wallets that were found and, and left uh, at the police station to be returned. Um, every once in a while you'd see a bouquet of flowers uh, next to some rubble and you knew that that was where somebody passed away and they were paying their last respects to those people. The uh, spirit of uh, perseverance was strong. Gambaru Ishinomaki persevered, uh, keep trying. Uh, missionary service was, was a great opportunity and we even divided up. Uh, not much was left. Uh, wherever you went, there was just a complete <coughs> devastation. This is Sister Fudakawa. When we prayed about what we should do and how we should do it, we received the Spirit from God. The brethren were remarkable. They were there immediately. We were out visiting homes. We were out doing what good priesthood brethren were doing, uh, being among the people. And that's, uh, of course, what good Latter-day Saints do. Um, the uh, churches became depositories for goods. Uh, we couldn't even hold church in, in many of our buildings because it was just full of supplies. Wherever you went, uh, people were helping. Uh, the church chartered buses for every ward in Japan so that they could come up and help and assist in the uh, 
cleanup and in, in the uh, restoration of these people in, in insisting in all kinds of ways, uh, even just getting people to talk and to get them to break out of their shock. Uh, one of the things that they did was uh, to do little hand massages to uh, give the people some comfort and to get them to talk again about uh, where they were and what they were doing so that uh, they can start to uh, uh, live a normal life and kind of get out of the devastation that they were in. Blankets came immediately. Food and blankets were important and the church uh, provided those and uh, we had so many blankets that came in and from all over the world. And of course the volunteers were important. The, the greatest volunteer, the greatest opportunity was for the youth because you know, they, could, they didn't have jobs and they could, could, could be there full time. The church was very wise as well and they called people on one month missions. A lot of people can, you know, leave work for a month and come out and help. And so they called people on one month missions and they came out and volunteered. Uh, they provided transportation and ways to get around. Uh, it was just remarkable the things that are needed in a, an emergency. And of course, uh, the uh, churches became the nerve centers for uh, our emergency response. And the priesthood leaders uh, took control and and uh, did what was necessary to save these people. And then we started reaching out to other areas and other cities and uh, provided uh, benefits, uh, means of being able to go back and uh, uh, be engaged in meaningful work. Devastation was you know, wherever, and of course it wasn't just limited to our members, but to all of Japan. Um, We'll end with this site. The two sisters, when we got off the bus after doing service, I broke down and just wept and wept. We asked them uh, what was wrong, and they said, a little over a month ago, we proselyted this area and knocked on every house. And now there's not a house that's standing. And as they cried over their, their people, we knew or felt a little bit of what God feels as he looks over us and protects us. Our testimony is that God delivers us. He will deliver us day to day. He is there on our right side and our left, and he goes before our face. There will come a time when you have to depend on the Lord because you can depend on no one else, and you need that extra strength. And we testify that he will be there for you, and that uh, that is the greatest preparation that we need to be close to the Lord, so that we can feel of his promptings and feel of his love and peace. And we give you that testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.